in the morning for the sixth day. Shall we pray? Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for this very first chapter of your book. Mm. Please fill pastor with your spirit. Help us to learn from it. Help us to go away from here understanding more and encouraged. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, as we continue our series in Genesis chapter 1, we're going through the days of creation. And there's such good doctrine in each of these little verses. I remind you, the Bible teaches that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So it's profitable for us to pay attention to this and learn from it and to study it and meditate on it. It is profitable for reproof. It is profitable for correction and instruction in righteousness. There's so much that we can learn from these few verses. And so I trust that today, as we go through day number three, we're going to learn something. Now, as we finish the chapter, as Brother Chad was reading it, you notice at the end of chapter one, it does say that the herbs and the fruit, the trees, the grasses, those were for meat. That was the food for the animals and the humans in the day that God created all of that. So if you, just kind of a recap, in day number one, we know that God gave us the heavens, the earth, there were waters that were present. We had darkness and light. We had day and night. There was good. He said it was good. Uh, there was time, space, and matter all wrapped up in one in the first day. The second day, we see that he began to separate the heavens uh, with the waters. There's waters and heavens, and uh, we learned that there are three distinct heavens taught in the Bible. We also touched on the canopy theory that there was a canopy of water surrounding the earth that perhaps changed how things were after the great flood. God did break open uh, the deep and also drop waters from the heavens. So we touched on all that on day one and two. Day number three, we're going to see the dry land is created. We're going to see the seas and also all the vegetation. I, I wrote a note here, make it real easy for everybody. Uh, dirt and seas and veggies. Now if I could get everybody, and I mean everybody, to say that with me. Day number three, dirt and seas and veggies. Let's try it again. Day number three, dirt and seas and veggies. All right, very good. Somebody's awake. If not, I hope that'll wake you up. I might test you. If, if I see you falling asleep, I'm going to startle you, call you out by name, and ask you, but the answer's on the board. So if, you, if that happens to you, you know where to look for the source. Okay, uh, speaking of the source, let's go back to the word. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to read verse number 9. Genesis 1, verse number 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. Now when it says in verse number 9, if you look at it, uh, d does it say the waters are above the heaven or below the heaven? Because we touched on the different waters in our illustration here. Uh, remember there was the canopy, there was also waters above the farthest heaven we saw in Psalm 148. But here, what waters are we dealing with? Are we dealing with the waters in the heavens? Look what it says. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So he's gathering all the water together in one place. This is on the face of the earth as it's becoming. Continue in verse number 10. He gives us that name. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas and God saw that it was good so here earth begins to take shape uh, it's beginning to be molded by God's hands I mean I could just visualize taking uh, lumps of clay or play-doh as a man and forming it and trying to copy what God has created could you imagine trying uh, what we perceive as the different layers and levels and the grasses and and everything that he's going to create boy it would take us some time and this is not just God sort of grabbing stuff and randomly twisting it to see what happens no this is by design this is very intentional. I imagine volcanic activity uh, beginning to boil up and surface and uh, pushing things to the top and the dirt moving, rocks and crystals forming as it happens, the different layers, the mountains, the hills, the valleys. We see all of those things, and but then it's displacing the water, and God calls the systems of water on the earth, God calls them seas. What was on day number three? Help me out. All right, all right, dirt and seas and veggies. All right, let's try it one more again. What was on day number three? Dirt, dirt and seas and veggies. So here God pushes the dirt up. The water's displaced. That water is called seas. Now, interestingly enough, we 
in our super intelligence as human beings, we've come up with new terminology. And we say, no, no, those aren't seas, those are oceans. And then there's seas, and then there's lakes, and there's ponds, and there's streams, and creeks, and yada, 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 running down the road. Right? So, but, but God called it all seas to begin with. Now, he does use the word rivers and ponds and you know things like that. But I just want you to know the system, he does initially begin to call seas. The word ocean is not in the Bible, just like dinosaur is not in the Bible. That doesn't mean they don't exist. That just means man has come up with a new term to label what God has already created. So uh, be clear, when God does say seas, it's not that there weren't any oceans, but today what we call oceans, God in the beginning called seas. The dirt and the seas and the veggies. So everything comes uh, to form. Uh, in Isaiah 45, he says, Thus saith the Lord, that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he hath created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Why did God create the earth? To be inhabited. God knew what he was doing. Man wasn't an after plan, man was the original plan. God had a plan. And again, imagine if you're kneading dough, right? So you ladies that make bread, and some of you uh, uh, young adults that make cookies, Right? There's usually bubbles that form in the dough and you have to get it out, right? Well, in the same way, I believe subterranean, we began to have uh, different caves and chambers and geological formations. There were different things that happened, uh, hollows and caverns, crystals, aquifers with water. There's all these different things happening below, even especially where the lava is at. There's nat natural gas reservoirs. So as God brings all this together, I mean, we look down and we see dirt and we're pretty simple but if we could keep going soon we would find something different some certain rocks and crystals and minerals and then perhaps we would find water and then we would find gases that were flammable or deadly to us and then we'd find lava and so on and there's so many things below us that we can't perceive yet they're there and that's how God began to put things together and I say all that because this is precision this is precise design with a purpose he lays the foundation. He begins to create something. There's a system of how the water brings the minerals down, and the water through the hydrological cycle will purify itself and eliminate some of the toxins that we don't, that we shouldn't be drinking. So God has a system in design as He's bringing this together. Yea, it's called intelligent design. Is one label that does accurately fit. God, with intelligence, designed something for us. Why? Well, what will we eat? Can we eat mud? Well, there's some clay you can eat, but that's a whole other discussion. God created plants. Let's continue in the scriptures. Look at verse number 11. 1, 11. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Now, this is important. Why is God making grass? Psalm 104 tells us, He causeth grass to grow for the cattle, and herb to grow for the service of man, that he may bring food out of the earth. Very clear, he has a plan with this. It's not random. And uh, the scientists of today, they're so foolish. They can't comprehend anything. All they can do is observe and then try to make up a reason why it wasn't God creating, yet it was nature making itself or becoming what it is. God had a plan from the beginning. It would be for food. It would be to nourish the life that he would later put on the earth. Continue in verse number 12, Genesis 1:12, And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. So God sees that it's good. Again, but what does he give us? Grass and herbs and trees. We have seeds and we have fruits for our meat. This would be our food. This would be to sustain us and nourish us. I want to focus on something here. In Genesis 1.11, that's 1.1.1, one, 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 three ones, all right? Uh, ooh, what's God up to here? This is unique, right? Uh, but there's a new word that he introduces here in Genesis 1. We'll see it more, and I want to lay a foundation today as we'll keep reaching back to this. He introduces a new term, kind. You see it? Look at it. It says, after his kind. Everything, the grass, the herb, the trees, it says, after his kind. What does that mean? Listen, today we have scientists that don't believe in this. This one word is very simple, uh, but the grasses, the herbs, the trees, the fruit, the seeds, it's a kind. And only certain kinds can create the same kind. And one kind cannot create another kind. This is so important, it should be a no-brainer. 
Cats and dogs do not make cogs or dats. We know that. Is there any, is there any kids that are confused on that? Cats and dogs can't intermingle. They are different kinds. We'll tell that to the scientists because they can't quite figure that out. It goes with plants as well. Now, strawberries grow low in the straw. Boy, I love strawberries. Maybe if we could intermingle it with bamboo, then it would be tall berries. And we could just, you know, pick them and grow them like that. It doesn't work that way. You can't do that. These are different kinds. It's a genus and plants and there's, uh, but the thing is, the word they use to attack it is species. Well, that's a species that evolved over time. This is a different species of dog, but that's not really accurate. I mean, I love sweet potatoes, you know? Hey, and I love sweet potato fries. Uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. All right, what kind of oil are you boiling that in? No, I'm just kidding. All right, uh, but sweet potatoes, what if we could mix sweet potatoes with snap peas? So you could have a tree that just grew the fries, I mean, there you go, they're right there. I mean, it would save the effort of cutting them up, okay? Well, that's a different kind, it would never work. Now, the God-hating scientists that create genetically modified organisms, they are taking things like salmon DNA and injecting it into tomatoes and trying to make these abominations for their own purpose and ultimately God will wipe out those crops and destroy those crops and perhaps those things will cause a famine. They do it to our corn. Our corn is an abomination, what they've done to modify modify it, and it literally makes a poison that destroys the stomach of the beetle, and what happens to you when you eat it? Well, we're just not as big of a living organism. Yeah, but you're still a living organism. It still creates that poison. Plants and animals can only reproduce after their kind, and it's interesting. I just had somebody this week share this with me. This was a gift. Does anybody know what this is? No. Not a pomelo, not a grapefruit. It's a lemon. Oh, now, wait a minute. How, this is not a lemon. I've seen lemons. They're only this big. Well, what did they do? I know they mixed a cantaloupe in a lemon. Does anybody think that's true? No, not true. This is, I, I call it a Goliath lemon, but that's not really what it is. All right. This is a ponderosa lemon. Ponderosa lemon. It is a mix of a pomelo, you're right, and also a lemon. And they combine the two because they're of the same kind into a tree, and this is the fruit. It's all in the citrus family, the citrus kind. Now, remembering this as we move forward, we'll talk about animals and people and the ark. You know, God put all of, he put certain kinds on the ark. He didn't have to have 250 species of dogs. He only needed a couple, right? Because the kind, you say, well, I've seen big dogs, I've seen little dogs, they can't reproduce. Yeah, but the big dog can mate with the medium dog, and the little dog can mate with the medium dog, and the rest in between are mutts, okay? And it's kind of unique how the DNA sequence is there. In fact, I compare it to piano. Could I get some help on the piano? Thank you, Brother Luke. Kind is not a species. Kind is a family. Right? And can you play guitar music on the piano? No, that's a different kind of music. Now, there are different kinds of piano music. What if this piano and all of the keys represented the potential for the DNA sequence, the genome, right? Uh, Luke, can you give me a fast kind of piano music? That's good, all right. All right, who taught you that? Brother Jacob. Oh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> now, what if we needed a really slow and dramatic and emotional kind of piano music? All right, I'm falling asleep. You gotta stop that. Okay, all right. All right, and some banjo music. That's not banjo. Hold on a minute. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the demonstration. I appreciate your help. Uh, we're going we're gonna to slay the giant after. Okay, who wants to make some giant lemonade this afternoon? All right, good. Well, perhaps that's what we'll do. All right. Uh, I give you this as an example to try to help you understand. You cannot uh, naturally take an apple and an orange. They don't mix. It's a different kind. God has families of kinds, and within it are many species. There is the canine family. And you have everything from wolves and jackals and chihuahuas and coyotes and foxes and hundreds of dogs that we can't even name. Most of them are just a mutt to me, right? Uh, but there's all these interesting breeds and German shepherds. And, uh, of course, yeah. a lot of them work together. This is how God's work. All of the canines are one kind. 
Don't let an evolutionist steal from you. Well, listen, you don't understand that uh, the wolf evolved from the coyote and the German shepherd evolved. It's a new species. It's a brand new species. No, this is of the same family. It's of the same kind. This piano can play things that all of us in here, none have ever heard. It has the potential in the keys. It's up to the order of the sequence. Think about it. It's how it's organized and ordered. There's so many keys here. There's so many options. Is this one on or is this one off? What's the sequence? And hey, that's up to the creator, isn't it? So God has created things with many different potentials. And so I want you to remember that. Go to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to remember, though, that a species is not what they tell us, that we need to remember the kind. Species does not equal kind. God created kinds. There are many different kinds of human beings, and humans can mate with humans. There are many different types uh, of primates, of apes, and apes can mate with apes. But guess what? The two don't work. Now, in certain families, like horses with donkeys, you have some very unique things, but what you'll never see is things mating outside of their kind. They cannot reproduce after their kind. Their seed is in them. The programming is in us. That's how God made us. There is systematic order and precision to the design in everything that God has made. You're in Genesis chapter 2, find verse number 4. Genesis chapter 2, find verse number 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. He's giving us the generation or the accounting thereof, right? Verse 5, he says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. Now, wait a minute. God says there was a plant before it grew. There was an herb before it grew. What's he saying here? And listen, Genesis chapter 2, this is not a uh, recreation account. This is the account of what God did, but he's trying to tell us something. He's given us a second witness. He's giving us some uh, knowledge to go along with it. Before it was made in the field, it was made in the mind. Before they build a bridge, it starts off in somebody's mind, doesn't it? Yeah. Before this piano was manufactured, it started out as some blueprints. Somebody had the idea. It was created once in the mind, and perhaps it's created on the paper, and then it's made in the flesh, and we can see it manufactured of the resources given to us on earth. Well, God did the same thing. He had a design full of intelligence. It was very specific. He put it in order. For a specific reason, there is systematic order to all that he does. So the generations or the genesis of the origin of these things, God put it together for a reason. Go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter number 1. Everything is made twice. Again, this is not a recreation account. This is just another account, the telling of the creation, how God works. Everything starts in the mind with us, and then we make it with our hands, and so did God. He had a plan from the very beginning. Christ was not a plan B. Christianity was not a plan B. Man was not another, God knew from the beginning what would happen and when the flood would happen. And he knew you before you were formed in the womb. He's the father of spirits. He knew how long you'll live. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows it all. You can't hide anything from God. Yeah. And yet he creates us with a choice, the free will, to choose to believe in him and to choose to worship him. But scientists are not so. Uh, evolutionists have a wicked heart toward God. They reject the God that they know is true. Romans 1, find verse number 19. Romans chapter 1, find verse number 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. They know they're born with light. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God knows what he's doing. He had a plan. He made it happen. God is awesome, right? But verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. He's saying they had dreams, these vain dreams of other things. They wanted to reject God and they used their imagination of evolution. And it says professing themselves to be wise. They, they are professors of evolutionary science. And God says they are fools. They're claiming that something else made them. They're claiming that nothing made something. They're saying nature made itself anything but God 
made me. Because if God made me, well, then I have to answer to him, don't I? We are responsible to our creator. And, you know, <laughs> denying that God created your soul does not change your fate with him. It does not change the fact that you have an eternal fate. You must stand before God. Look at verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and to creeping things. Well, now this is getting interesting. They're taking the thought or the concept of God, of who he is, and they're changing it into something it's not. Uh, we know that idolatry has always been a problem. We're making God in our own image. We're making uh, the, the one true living God into a statue, a carving, a, a brick, a rock, something that he is not. This still happens in many cultures today. The Catholic Church is one of the worst in their paganism. Uh, but we're taking God and making him something he isn't. But here they, they say, into corruptible man. Like people say that man can become God. Or into birds or four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, into the nature. You're saying that the creator is really the creation? Well, now hold on a minute. I'm sure, you know, we all know that things consist in the creation by him. And sure that he is in all things and everything is sustained by him. But that doesn't mean that nature itself, these plants are not God. This is not your God. This is evidence of God. But they change that. They hate God. And, you know, the warning, there's this warning here of the folly of idolatry. You can't make a God. No. God made you, and he made you for a purpose. You have a reason. God has a plan for your life. God has a perfect will that if you choose to step inside of, you can have a great ministry for God. Look at verse 24. Romans 1, 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. This is earth worship and animal worship, and, oh, no, we can't bulldoze because there's uh, uh, mites on the beach or whatever. You know, there's some reason, oh, there's a mouse in the woods. We can't uh, use these trees to he heat up our houses. There's all these reasons they want to worship nature, and really uh, it's all, it all goes back to idolatry. And, you know, evolution is a very dark religion. It's an evil religion, and it's rejecting God in your mind. And when you do that, your mind will become dark, your heart will become hardened. Your conscience will become seared. Uh, jump ahead to verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God gave them over to a rejected mind. You want to reject God? Well, God will reject you and your mind will become dark. If you would, go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Evolution teaches that we came from a rock or from a stick or from bacteria. It rained for billions of years on a rock and a puddle turned into mud and then the mud, something slimed out of it and that's what we are. Uh, listen to this. They say, humans evolved from earlier primates. That's a lie. That is a lie. Uh, the whole, uh, the human DNA is the closest to chimp DNA. I touched on that. Uh, there is an article in El Pesera where they show that they didn't completely fulfill the sequence of the genome. And once they did, they realized there were errors in it because it was polluted with human DNA. So that's a lie that, oh, well, we've been saying it for years and years, and it turns out it's not true 20 years later. We'll just keep saying it. Yeah. We'll leave that lie in the textbook. That's okay. We're still going to uh, point back to that error. That's the way evolutionary science works. It's a conspiracy. Uh, humans evolved from earlier primates, who evolved from earlier mammals, who evolved from earlier reptiles, who evolved from earlier amphibians, who evolved from earlier fish, who evolved from earlier invertebrates, who evolved from worms. What? Worms? That evolved from mitochondria that originated with common eukaryotic cells, which are shared with plants, by the way. So, this is my granddaddy? <laughs> Hold on a minute. No, 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 not this, but the slime that the plant came out of. You came out of that same slime. We share DNA, right? Well, then what do they do? They make an idol of nature, of television, of some false god, of Buddha, or whatever it is, of Baal. And they say, this is your god, any god but the god of the Bible. Why would they do such a thing? I want you to see this. There's nothing new under the sun. This is just old school paganism. You're in Jeremiah chapter 2. Uh, Jeremiah was given a word by God to go preach it to an evil nation that had rejected God. They were living their own way. And God said, judgment is coming. I'm going to get you. I'm going to destroy you. Uh, look at Jeremiah 2, verse number 11. 
Go to Jeremiah 2, verse number 11. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid, and be very desolate, saith the Lord. Listen, oh, a nation changing their gods. Boy, that's what happened to America, isn't it? Yeah. A nation that has forgotten God, there's hell to pay. This is very dangerous. God says, I will judge you, I will destroy you, be horribly afraid. God is not happy with the teachings and the American science curriculum. He is not happy that every mainstream media news outlet called conservative or liberal, they're going to teach evolution as a fact in its pure lies from the ground up. It has been for 150 years. You're in Jeremiah 2, go to 26. I want you to see this, how they uh, make a God in their own image. It's just old school stuff, right? Uh, look at verse 26. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not the face, but in the time of their trouble they say, arise and save us. What do they do? They turn to a stock. Look, uh, if this tree grows up and we take the branch and we carve it out and we say, behold, this is my God. Can that God save you? One day you're going to call on the real God and say, save us. And he's going to say, why should I? Why should I? You didn't honor me when you knew who I was. Look at verse 27 again. Saying to a stock, thou art my father. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine making a God in your own image? Why would you make a God in your own image? Well, he's more lenient. He lets me stay up past midnight. <laughs> he lets me sin however I want and doesn't judge me for it. There's no rules. There's less laws. I don't think God cares if you're married or if you get drunk. That's not the kind of, oh, listen, this, and this, is, this is wicked. It's to justify sin. Let me give you an example. Children. Dad comes home. He says, clean up your room or you're in trouble. The kids get together and they say, you know what? We need a new dad. Let's say to this, this stalk, let's say to this wood here, thou art our father. This is our new dad. Dad, can we stay up late? What a great dad. <laughs> dad, can we have ice cream? Oh, this dad's great. Do we really have to clean up our room or can we live in squalor? Oh, we just love our new dad. They say to a stock, thou art our father. They call a graven image our God. You know what idolatry is? That's taking God's glory and ascribing it to something that's not. Now, how do you think I would feel if I came home and my children were hugging this and saying, Dad, we love our dad. And I'm like, what is this? Well, that's our dad, really. Then let your dad pay the power bill. Oh, let your dad, uh, you know, put some food on the table. Think about it. Yeah. This is how angry God got with them because he, they disrespected him. They knew the truth. Every one of us, I mean, we laugh. Oh, sure, come on, that's not a father. Yeah, well, isn't that kind of what they did? Yeah. This is our father. This is our God. This is our creator. Oh, this is just a piece of wood. It's a stock. Think about it. God knows the heart of the evolutionist. God knows what they're guilty of. And it's common because today we in America, we don't really bow down to wood, although there's, there's plenty that do. We have televisions. We, we, bow, we, we fold our hands and we bow our face to our phone and we stare at it and we give it all of our attention and adoration and we learn from it and we pray to it and we, oh, if there's an important message, it's going to be found here. And if we need to talk to somebody important, it's going to be found here. Are we elevating things above our Creator? Look at Jeremiah 2.28. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can save thee, in thy time of trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Boy, doesn't that sound like America? There's always some new religion that anybody will give a chance. Anything but the God of the Bible. Anything but Christianity. That's what they've come to hate. If you would go to Revelation chapter 8. Go to Revelation chapter 8. God loves us. He created us for a purpose. Even in the amazing, intricate design of every one of these plants, there's so much information. There's more information in these plants than there is in my computer. 
or in a camera or anything else that man can make, there's more information in one of these leaves, one of these plants. It's self-sustaining. It converts energy. It creates a new form of energy. I mean, it's just amazing what it can do. God is a genius. God is intelligent, and he created us with a purpose, and he shows himself to us in everything, especially in nature. You know, maybe that's why there's certain times we feel like, I just want to go out in the woods and be alone from this weird world for a minute, and I just want to kind of get close to my maker a little bit, feel a little refreshed. That's natural. That's how God made us. In Revelation 8, if you would go to verse 7, this is dealing with the trumpet judgments at the end of the time when God pours out his wrath. And in the beginning, on the third day, God created the dry land, the seas, the grass, the herbs, the trees. And when he begins to pour out his wrath to really afflict those that think it's okay to worship an antichrist as a God, God takes those blessings away from people. Look at it. Uh, Revelation 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. They were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. God has promised he will never destroy the earth with a flood, but he will destroy it with fire. And that's not this. This is just him getting started in purging it, right? Uh, verse 8, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Now what did God make on day three? Everyone help me. What did God make on day three? The dirt, the seas, and the veggies. In God's wrath, that's what he begins to destroy. He says, well, you don't appreciate me? Let me take these things away from you, and then let's see who you call upon. Go to Revelation chapter 9. Go to the next chapter, Revelation 9, and find verse number 20. Revelation 9, 20. As God reverses his blessings, look how man responds. The Bible reads, And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Idolatry, even in the end times, after seeing the Lord, seeing all of His works, they still will not repent of worshiping what they have made. They trust their own power. They trust their own creation, their own electronics rather than God. They worship devils, though, it says right there. That's pretty damning. The evolutionist knows what he's doing. He understands that his fate has been sealed. He knows where he's going. He knows the God that he preaches against, and he knows the judgment that will come for that. Verse 21, Neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor their thefts. And that's why they do it. They want to do what they want to whomever they want and feel like they can get away with it. Go to Revelation 21. We're almost done. We'll finish in Revelation 21. The children of God, we have a perfect future to look forward to. Those that reject God, uh, they want to hurt people and take from people and think they can get away with it. And yeah, you know, this is sort of their kingdom. The, their God is called the God of this world. That's Lucifer, lowercase g. He's a fake God. And uh, if you just look at Hollywood, you'll see that if you serve Satan, he'll give you pleasure for a season. He'll give you riches and wealth, but you'll never have true joy. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never understand contentment that God provides. We have something better to look forward to. Revelation 21, find verse number 4. Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. What a promise. He made it once. He's going to make all things new. He will renew. The, we have a promise. Look, he says, And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life, freely. Listen, salvation is free. You can drink of the fountain of the water of eternal life freely. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Period. It's done. All your sins paid for, even the ones you have not yet committed. In Revelation 22, he says, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's your choice. God put us here for a choice. He gave us all these plants to choose what we'll do with them. It's our choice. But we answer to God. 
There are those that will not repent and turn and trust in Jesus for salvation. They won't believe in Him as their God and Creator, and there's a judgment to come. Look at verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What a powerful verse when you know what it means. He says, he that overcometh shall inherit. We have an inheritance with Christ. We are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? How do we obtain that? How do we overcome? Be saved. How? 1 John 5, 5 tells us, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? If you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you overcome this world, and you have another world to look forward to. John 1, 12, he says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Notice that in verse 7. Look at it again. He says, Who is he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We become the children of God. We're in his family, and we're children forever. Galatians 3 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We have something to look forward to, and we get there by faith. And those that reject God and will not repent, look at verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters. That's a pretty bad list, right? Well, I'm glad I'm not one of those. And all liars. Uh-oh. Found guilty. We're all found guilty. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Listen, you either get a second life or you get a second death. You either get eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ and you get the blessings that come from Him, or it's eternal hellfire, a punishment. And thank God He loves us enough. He sent His Son to die for us, to give us the gift of God, which is eternal life through faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for Your creation and all the great things that You've done for us. Lord, thank You for giving us the plants. I pray that You would help us to remember that, that on day three You gave us the dirt and the seeds and all the veggies, and I pray that You would help us to appreciate what You've given Help us to remember you when we look at them, and help us to worship you and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name.